Welcome to the Surprise Truth, a timely insight that can change your life forever. And our show is featuring a lot of thought leaders, opinion makers, who will give us a new insight that could somehow change our lives. We have with us here today, Nalin Kumar Singh, who has been very active in uh, the education sector across the region, uh, in India, in Indonesia, across ASEAN. There are several programs that are being uh, run by him which is going to be impacting the lives of a lot of people, especially the young and the ones who are working in companies at the early stage. So with Nalin, we're going to have a very interesting conversation to talk more about some of the surprise truths that he has been facing. So welcome Nalin to Thank the you, surprise Sanchi. truth. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. So I would actually like to go straight into the discussion because uh, I feel that the education sector has transitioned itself in a very big way and in the process it has revealed the many surprise truths which may not be so visible to a lot of people so in your opinion what are the surprise truths that you have discovered in the education sector so let me focus on the higher education sector sure. uh, that's where the mass is coming out looking for jobs etc firstly i believe that it is the last traditional stronghold and industry that is waiting for a digital revolution and a complete disruption. It hasn't happened. It's happened in every sector. It has happened. It hasn't happened here. You know, yesterday I was uh, going home in Jakarta. My wife was with me and she was getting calls from these international universities asking her to enroll in these short skill based courses, six to 60 week kind of courses, phenomenally priced. Some of the topmost universities of the world are trying to convince her that if she does this course, it doesn't matter what she studied in the past. It doesn't matter where she lives. It doesn't matter what her age is. But if she does this course, it propels her career and gets her off to a good start. So I asked them, if that is true, why do you have these 10,000 people on your campus? Doing longer courses. Doing these three to five year courses. What are you selling to them? You're charging more here or less here. Why don't you upskip, leave them free in six to 60 weeks? Why have you trapped them in this Ponzi scheme of three to five years? Graduation, then post-graduation, then PhD and no job still. So that's one. Absolutely a question and a surprise truth for people as well as universities as to what is it that you're really selling here. The other, educators know it. I, I don't envy educators today. It's mm. a very tough job. People talk of mental health, digital divide of students. They never think of that for the educators. They have the same problem. So they are sitting in a classroom full of young people who are smarter than them, they are the most educated person in the classroom. And if they ask the class, would any of them like to be like them or be an educator, the answer will be no. So the most educated person in the classroom is not a role model for the people he's teaching. It's, it's ironical, isn't it? It's very ironic. Yeah. Then if you look at what learners want today, this is the era of industry 5.0 or 4.0, wherever we are. It's the era of mass customization. Learners want personalized learning. That means they don't want standardization, they want personalization. You can't stand in front of a classroom and give one size fits all. They want things uh, personalized to their level of skill. And second, they want outcome. If they came for a job, they want a job. So this is not the era of you know content or technology. This is the era of methodology and outcome. That's the third thing. So the surprise truths that you're talking about should trigger the complete change in how the sector is uh, structured. Yeah. I don't think it has sunk into the university's uh, administration. So are, are, what are they protecting? What is, what is the issue that's coming in the way? It's a sunk cost. There's a huge campus. Every time you walk in, you get an adrenaline rush. What a beautiful building. What a beautiful campus, manicured lawns, and my alumni, my fund, my trust that runs this. They're all stuck in that. While they're going through this university modern makeover and trying to sell these short courses outside. Really, in the heart of hearts, they know. Time's up. Except for the very, very good ones, the elite 1%. It's time to shut down. So is there a formula for them to reinvent themselves? What, what should a university See, be doing today? If you look at Ideally, if you yeah. own a university yeah. and so you have these surprise truths, what would you do? So what is it that they're doing now? Okay. They are trying to peddle information and knowledge 
in an era when the industry wants skills, competencies, and job readiness. That's the gap. You're stuck in information and knowledge, which the internet has completely taken over. Yeah. And they want skills, competency, and uh, orbit job readiness, which you could argue is almost like industry saying, I want unicorn talent every time they walk, in, walk out of the university. But you can't argue with that. That's what the market wants. The universities lack a complete industry connect. They are teaching what they have content for and what they have educators for. They are not teaching what learners desire or industry wants. I'll give you an example. In every generation, if you look at who the role models are, mm. you get an idea of what people want to become. Yes. Right? That's what we want to t inculcate in them. In earlier generations, take yours or mine, role models would be freedom fighters, scientists, technologists. Today, who are the role models for the young people? Influencers, sports people, film stars. Where does education fit into all this? None of them have got a college degree. I would argue even the gods we worship don't have college degree. Farmers who grow don't have college degree. Soldiers who fight don't have college degree. The jobs that are in most demand in numbers across the world is truck driver, mason, carpenter. It's all skill based. These are the jobs that are in demand in hundreds of thousands of jobs or industry or uh, agricultural equipment uh, drivers, operators. These are the jobs in demand. None of them require a college degree. We have created a kind of FOMO mass hysteria and wrapped this college degree thing around the middle class and pushed most of them into deep debt. Universities have caused a huge social problem. They need to get out of it. Even now, the skill-based courses, the short ones, 6 to 60 weeks that they are peddling, is without outcome. That's why nobody's buying them. They are saying, I can sit in America or Vietnam or anywhere, and I can teach you, you sitting anywhere. You'll get a certificate with my great university's name on it. Will I get a job? Yeah. So going back to the competency issue that universities actually don't have uh, uh, teachers, uh, actually, who have industry skills or experience. And uh, do you think that could be part of the bigger pro part of the problem? It is. If you look at the educators today, they keep harping on the fact that our students need internships. I think they need internships. Nobody should be allowed to teach any subject unless they have practices, practiced it for two to five years in a corporate or some professional organization, environment, some organization. some organization. We have people fresh out of college teaching people. They are children themselves. And mm -hmm. these are people or they are so embedded in the system. They have been there for 20, 30, 40 years and they have this cultured respect from their learners because they have no option, right? This is the guy who's going to sign their mark sheet. That they're so disconnected with the rest of the world. You walk into many of the campuses, you'll feel you've come into industry 1.0. It looks the same, just the fees has gone up five to 10 times. Okay, so I'm going to connect this to something you said earlier. Uh, what's the surprise truth about jobs? What's happening in the job market today? And how do you see uh, there is going to be some fundamental change in the amount of jobs being created or people being ready for jobs. What's the surprise truth? Because I believe you've been working a lot on uh, the job side. Yeah. See, the job readiness side is a big area. If you look at where jobs are being created, the media is full of hype about jobs being created in AI and the digital space. And there is so much shortage in the digital space. We need, take ASEAN, we need 8 or 18 million people to be digitally upskilled to pick, pick up those jobs. Everybody talks about that. 10 times that number is required for all the manual roles I mentioned. Truck drivers, agricultural equipment uh, operators, masons, carpenters, painters, 10 times. And they pay higher. So who wants to take those jobs? What kind of profile of people today, the young people, do so they want those jobs? Yeah, so there is a profile of people who want those jobs. Uh, and it falls in two categories. One is in the poorer countries, developing countries, people who take those jobs out of compulsion or because their family was doing that historically. In the richer countries, you have this unique phenomenon. And I would take the example of Canada, where PhDs from Punjab, India, are giving up, selling their houses, giving up everything, going to Canada and becoming a truck driver. 
because it pays two hundred thousand dollars a year. So there is a de- so it's a change in profession. Absolutely, Which depending on where the money education. is. Yeah. So all these people for years they pursued formal education for what? They didn't get anything out of it, and you can see that happening in large parts of the world. And the media and universities are still peddling that small slice of tech, digital, and service-oriented job. It's still very small in most countries. Yeah. So, is there a nexus between the industry and the academic side? Because the industry still insists that you must have a degree before you get a job, and there are only a handful of companies who are willing to look against that process and go against the grain. Yeah. So, industry is not above blame either, right? When it suits them. For example, when they re- need talent in areas where academics have not yet caught up, take AI, cloud, uh, UI, UX, etc. They very quickly create content, put the certification around their company brand name, and then force students to take it. And then uh, for for t- for that area, because there's a shortage, they say, we don't want a college degree. But show me a guy who became a uh, vice president or president without a college degree. Maybe your founder because he is the one who started it. Yeah. But show me others in the company. So they are not above blame too. They need to come to the party. They demand for unicorn talent. They're not investing in talent when they walk walk in in terms of training them, etc. It's a big problem. But from university, from campus to corporate, the change that is required is humongous for a student today. In a, they go to university or school, etc., to learn what. Sometimes just to learn to read and write, right? Does anybody read and write today? Maybe they just go to learn how to be an adult in an adult world. Yeah, possibly. So, so life skills become more yeah, important. Campuses are more like social uh, for networking, alumni, etc. Now they have put this stuff about entrepreneurship, right? Which is funny to me. So I agree. So you know, if you think that universities are paying attention to what the industry is asking for. And industry sees that the degree might be a filter, you know, to shortlist the best of the best. Do you think there could be some other kind of a filter applied and not a five-year uh, sacrifice of your time? Do you think that the, you know, the universities are ready for creating a new filter which allows the best of the best to come through? So, which is not as intensive I, in time. And I work with a lot of universities, private and government. Right, the pressure of getting the numbers in every year is humongous. So, except that one percent elite universities, essentially they allow everybody to walk in. Anybody who can pay the fee walks in. So the input is just of any quality. Only later they start thinking. Now, what do we do with this? We have these eight faculties of study. Now we need to force fit each one into these. That's not how it should ideally be done. In fact, funnily enough, apart from the eight faculties, now they try to fit in entrepreneurship. They bring in all these people with a fixed mindset who want jobs and try to make them growth mindset people who are going to create jobs. Not going to happen. That's why most of the incubators are sitting idle. What they should be doing is using technology and modern science to good effect, which is do a test. Call it a psychometric test. Call it a capability test. Call it a competency test, skill test, whatever, and find out if the person has an aptitude for a particular branch of study, or A particular way. For example, if a person comes in and we see that the person has an aptitude for STEM subjects, or is technically or IT in inclined, we would suggest to the person that you should take up some of the more modern, upcoming IT roles like in AI, cloud, etc. And you really don't need to spend five years here unless you want a PhD in the subject. You can do six months, one year, and get gainfully employed. Most people need for the financial resources, you know. Yeah. So I heard you're looking for a campus, and your campus would be a center of skills. What would you do in that campus that's different from what universities are doing? I think all university campuses, except that one percent elite, which should remain as uh, centers of wisdom and research for industry and society at large, all other campuses should become community-based social campuses, where parents, industry, learners, everybody can interact. In a more informal manner. My vision of a skill-based campus is less classroom, more engagement. So, if I was running a campus, uh, which we are on the lookout for in various parts of the world, we would look at 
more corporate like buildings rather than massive amounts of real estate where people learn in a hybrid manner and we divide learning into four parts there's information there is knowledge there is skills there is competency information we can give it to them through self learning knowledge we can give it to them through instructors who answer the questions out of curiosity skills we call them to the classroom and make them uh, learn inculcate that in them and competency we make them do internships and actually experience the job so it will be a more experiential social environment rather than just trying to bring them into a classroom and do a one size fits all and it will start with that initial filter of doing a test and seeing who is best suited for what role and depending on their financial needs do they need a 6 month course and get a job or they do need a 2 year course and get a job and whatever they choose show them a path that okay you were in a hurry to get a job because of financial adversity 6 months get a job now here is a lifelong learning path keep up skilling yourself and grow as you are that's the path i would take so would you invite the industry to be in your campus absolutely uh take a traditional university or take any company when you start how do you start a company with an idea as a as an entrepreneur you validate the idea right you speak to potential clients you speak to every stakeholder and validate whether my idea makes sense whether i should do this or not now why wouldn't you do that when you open a university if i open a university here today wouldn't i engage with the industry and say what kind of candidates would you like to hire as freshers from what streams should they study what skills and competencies should they have wouldn't i go to learners and ask them for this kind of demand what is it that interests you and what would you like to do i would then set up a university i would then decide which faculty not on my own that oh i got this land i've made this beautiful building with my name on it let's pick up 10 faculties uh, let's pull in any students we have and then tell the industry here take them so what about so you would reverse engineer it reverse engineer it. okay good So I think you know th- those are interesting surprise truths uh, but I think I would like to back pedal a bit about you talked a lot about skills so what's the surprise truth about skills that you have discovered Actually it's there in my upcoming book called Ferocity uh halo skills for future leadership So when you look at it academically there are skills competencies traits habits etc I put everything into skills for for simplicity because i'm not an academician at all i'm an accountant so i put it just as skills yeah and i try to identify what are the five essential skills that people who are our role models exhibited and in role models i try to look at extreme role models so i chose god the hence halo skills what are the skills that the people we worship display all the time in their lifetime yeah. and beyond and i pick those up and i pick those five is what i call halo skills for example i'll give a couple out here number 1 and very very important in today's day of social media where attention spans are that of an ant people can't even watch a 1 minute reel without fast forwarding it the number one skill is indistractability can you focus on a task repeatedly for years and months because that's the vision for your life indistractability none of the gods achieved anything in 6 months 1 year or even uh, you know 5 years it's a lifetime's work so indistractability is a huge huge one for me the second example i would give is communicability which is Communi- a lot is to talk about communication skill yeah communication is nothing but connection can you through your words actions deeds body language connect with people so that you can lead them so that they follow you so that you can influence them influenceability so those are two skills and i think the remaining skills you should read the book and uh, get know about it so i'm going to end this with the last question to you what is the surprise truth about you yourself that was revealed to you in your journey you have been in my life journey for the last 40 years so y- you know i have spoken about this often when you do business or you do anything else 
there are a couple of things that are very important. One, the business can fail, the relationship should not. Whether it's your friends or family. Family you are born into, friends you make in your own lifetime. And businesses go through cycles, they go up, down, they shut down, bad times, good times. <clears throat> but the relationship should last. How you do that is a skill you learn over time. But that's one truth that will stare you in the face all the time. The second is the sheer pride in whatever you do, whether somebody is watching or not watching. The way you approach something and deliver because your name is attached to it, that pride, if it is not there, I don't think you'll succeed at anything. There are two things that I hold dear to myself throughout. And when did you come across this? Early or later in your career? The first one, I don't know, I think I was, the second one, which is take pride in what you do, is, I was born with. Yeah. Uh, anything I do, even if I'm polishing my car, I do it with a zeal as if I, it's almost manic. Uh, it could yeah. be an inconsequential consequential thing, tightening a bolt, but I'll do it with a zeal that's manic. But that's me. Yeah. The second one uh, about business failing and uh, relationships not that I learned the hard way between 2007 and 12 when I went through the bankruptcy uh, in some of the businesses I was leading that was a tough time and that's when I learned that the hard way who stays with you who does not and for what reason and then you see so many shades of that uh, of people and yourself after all you're not above blame too you see shades of yourself too uh, how you conduct yourself at that time with, with what grace whether you show tenacity, grit, determination or not. These you learn the hard way. Uh, I don't believe, having said that, a lot is written about people learning through failure. I don't believe in that. I think people can learn at any time. Failure only teaches you failure. Success teaches you success. So I, luckily I've seen shades of both in this lifetime so far. So I can make the differentiation. But too many young people are guided or misguided, uh, especially in entrepreneurship, to take a jump into oblivion without the skills, uh, <laughs> saying that you know, if you fail, you will learn. Come on, young mind, you'll be scarred for life. Yeah, uh, especially uh, in this part yeah, of the world. Yeah. yeah. So they, they force people to enter uh, entrepreneurship as a compulsion, not choice. That bothers me. Okay. Very good. So, you know, we have covered a lot of ground today on the surprise truths. We covered about education, about jobs. We also talked about skills. And I think uh, in this journey of uh, having a timely insight that can change your life, everything is about timing. There are a lot of insights around you, but the timing of when that insight is relevant to you is the most important thing. And that's why it's called the surprise truth, because it's staring at you in the face, but you don't see it sometimes. So here's to enjoying more surprise truths and looking forward to catch you at the next episode.